welcome. We are very, very impressed with the fact that so many people is here. <laughs> Some of you don't have shares even. Uh, thank you, thank you for this and for coming. Uh, we don't have translation, uh, so maybe we can speak in English. Uh, it will be perhaps uh, the, the, the language with more consensus in the room. But if feel free to speak Spanish if you want, because we try to translate, or at least uh, everyone will try to understand. So my name is José Igreja Matos. As you may know by reading the program, I'm the president of the International Association of Judges, uh, the biggest organization of the judiciary in the world with 94 countries, uh, national associations of judges. And I'm also a judge, a normal judge, in Court of Appeal of Porto, Portugal. So I'm a Portuguese judge. And we are very lucky today because we have a very uh, splendid uh, panel, very different backgrounds, very different uh, traditions, juridical traditions, um, common law, civil law, people connected with judges also, lawyers. Uh, Diego, I don't know how to characterize, <laughs> characterize you. Uh, being done so many things in life. Uh, but rapidly, we have Diego Garcia Sayan that was awarded today. You were in the opening ceremony, uh, I think. And you know, with Diego, wonderful, uh, besides being a friend, is, uh, he was during his mandate a special rapporteur for the independence of judges and lawyers. He was absolutely uh, impressive in the work he performed, always connected with judges. Every time we had a problem, he was immediately responding. He was really one, I, I knew already five special rapporteurs. And Diego was really special in, in his work. And I, I want to say publicly, because it, it is the expression of, of, the, of the truth. Um, Jose Ramon Cosillo, the Minister of the Supreme Court of Justice of the Nation until 2018 in Mexico, Everyone knows uh, Jose Ramon. We have several Mexican <laughs> colleagues here that can, <laughs> that can say that with, with more, even more, <laughs> in, a, in a better way than me. Yeah, so you have a big crowd here. Wow. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, uh, Judge Joanna Seibert from, uh, S from District Judge here in New York, that is also a, a, a member of EAJ. She was in the board for several years and did a remarkable work in the ANAO group, that is the group of Asia and Oceania and North America. Uh, Leo Mori Gordon, uh, Senior Judge of the U.S. Court of International Trade, that is also a very renowned judge that is uh, a reference uh, in, the, in the area of international trade and much more, not here in the country, but all over the world. And our youngest one, <laughs> Juan Gonzalo Spina, a young criminal lawyer. Uh, I was very impressed because uh, he, he has even his name here in the, in the, in the program <laughs> as a sponsor, what is really remarkable. So you can see what we are, what we are talking about. So one of the great challenges that I present to you, and I will give you the answer, is what has judicial independence and the international human right to claim innocence that could be connected? And the, the, the answer, in my opinion, is basically nothing. <laughs> so we have two separate topics, very different ones. It's an experience, it's interesting. So you can listen about one topic, discuss about it, and then go to another topic that is totally different, but is also uh, a very, I, I would say, cutting edge topic today, because it's very modern. And this is really a situation that we all are now thinking about, finally. Uh, it started in the 90s, the innocence movement, uh, as ground out, but it began in the United States. But in the last decade, uh, it's been uh, increased uh, around the world. Innocence projects have sprung up on every continent. There are in Europe, there are in Africa, there are everywhere. 
And you know what it means. It means the possibility of exonerating wrongfully convicted individuals. With DNA evidence, forensic, uh, scientific evidence, you, you know, in, in the United States there are ma many examples of people that is in jail for many years and then it was found that they are not guilty, they are innocent, and there is a real difficulty in, in, in getting these people out of jail, in, in getting these people uh, uh, in a situation that they deserve because they are absolutely innocent of the crimes they are accused of. So there is, uh, by Duke University and many other people around the uh, United States, m most universities, uh, a movement, a project that is starting to recognize this international human right to claim innocence, regardless of the conviction has already been in the past, regardless of all these reasons that you know about certainty and security in the juridi juridical matters. If there is an innocent man, he has an international human right to claim uh, his or her innocence. And that is a very, very interesting thing to discuss and to know more about it. And we have the perfect persons to tell us about it, Joanna and Leo. So, but let's start with judicial independence. There are several panels here about judicial independence. Uh, it is one of the, it's been for many years, at least for me and for Diego, for sure, the main topic of our work, international work, our mission in International Association of Judges is to protect, to uphold, to defend judicial independence as a basic value of rule of law. And I have spoke about judicial in independence many times, and I, I had this feeling, now that my, my mandate is going to an end, that sometimes if you talk about judicial independence in a theoretical fashion, it's good for jurists, but it doesn't have the impact that we need to have to defend judicial independence. So I will briefly, I hope very briefly, uh, we'll speak about five persons, five concrete persons, five judges that were awarded by my organization last year in Tel Aviv, three of them, and next September in, in Taiwan, two more of them. I will announce their names here, so you, you will be <laughs> in first time knowing who is these judges that fought for judicial independence, that are facing so many problems in their personal lives because they are independent judges, because they want to uphold rule of law and decide in an <coughs> impartial manner, no matter what, no matter, no matter how powerful is the litigant uh, from one of the sides. I will not mention the countries, but I will mention the names. So if you Google it, maybe some of the names you know already. If you Google it, it's, it will be any, very easy to know what countries I'm talking of. The first name is Murat Arslan. Murat Arslan is a dear friend of mine. I know him for more than 15 years. He was a very devoted judge. Uh, he has a master's degree in Europe. Uh, he is a very technical and gift jurist, and he is in jail. Is in jail since 2016, condemned to 10 years of prison for basically being president of the association of judges in the country, the biggest one, and for speaking out loud about the values of human rights, rule of law, and judicial independence. He was arrested immediately after a supposed coup d'etat in the country, and is still in prison, and is still fighting, and courageously is still not regretting what he did and being very outspoken about what has happened in the country regarding rule of law. He was awarded with Vaclav Havel Prize from Council of Europe. That is a prize that is only given to very special personalities that have fought for these common values that join us here today. The second name is Erika Aifang. Eric Aifam is here in the United States, exiled. She's like an exiled person, a refugee if you want. Why? Because in her country she fought against cri criminal uh, 
networks, very powerful ones. She was menace. Uh, unfortunately, the political power is also connected with these criminal gangs. And the only solution for her to, was to escape. If she didn't leave the country, probably she wouldn't be uh, within ourselves, within, in this world, as I may say so. So Erika is another courageous woman that I know very well also. And I witness how they try to destroy her family with death threats, uh, persecuting the small car uh, shop that his father owned, and how the, the, the life, the personal life for Erika, uh, went to be a nightmare. And she, the only solution was to leave. And fortunately, they, the United States um, have the kind gesture of having her with, 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 uh, in the country, and she's living here for more than a year now. The third person's name is Christian Markiewicz. Christian is the president of the Association of Churches of his country. He's also a very, very persecuted judge, still fighting normally in the country. There is freedom of expression. We are talking of European Union country but more than 1,000 judges in this country that I mentioned are, are being persecuted. Disciplinary procedures, uh, transfers to different cities, reduction of salary, all kind of things that are being done in this particular country for those judges that are trying to defend the basic values of, of uh, rule of law. So just to give you an, an example, a judge is sanctioned in this particular country if he asks a question to the European Court of, the, uh, to the European Court of, Just of Justice, the European Union Court. If you go to the European Court, that is a court that is under supervision of all EU countries, you can be sanctioned only for doing this uh, normal procedural um, request. And now the names for next year. Anas Mehdi. Anas Mehdi is a, also a, a president of the association of his own country. He's, at this very moment, he was summoned two days ago for a criminal procedure and a disciplinary procedure, and is facing the, possi the possibility of being detained. And the rest, probably, it will happen. Let's hope not. But one thing is sure, he fought the dictatorship in 2011 when the Arab Spring began, and he's still in his country. He didn't leave, he's going to the court every day, and he's waiting for his destiny. Along with other judges, 57 were expelled uh, from one minute to the other without no disciplinary procedure in the country and the country itself is living also a very dangerous, uh, the temptation of autocratic regimes is, as you know, all over the world. The quality of democracies is worse in 80 countries since COVID, and this particular country is a very worrisome one. And Azar Parsem. Azar Parsem is an Afghan woman judge. I can say the country in, <laughs> in this particular situation because you know what happened in Afghanistan. Women in Afghanistan cannot go to school. Women in, in Afghanistan now, because of Taliban, they cannot even go to the street if they are not accompanied by the, the brother, the father, or the husband. They cannot go alone to the street. This is the situation in Afghanistan. And the women judges in Afghanistan, all of them, were persecuted by the Taliban. They escaped the country. T around 300, from 300, 270 are now out of the country. If they weren't, as if they don't escape, they will be raped, they will be tortured, they will be murdered. Because for the Taliban, there are two things that they don't admit. First is to have a woman in a position of power. And second, to have a woman condemning a man in a court of law and putting a man in, in, in a situation of uh, prison or whatever. This is for their mindset that is obviously barbaric. I cannot even understand how it exists today. This is 
absolutely unthinkable. So when Taliban took power, the first thing they went was for Afghan, for women judges. Women judges were the first tar target since day one of uh, the Taliban regime. So five names, five names to characteri characterize what is happening in the world. Um, and I think uh, you can easily know the name of the countries and perhaps with those who are speaking after me, we can understand the reasons why this is still existing in, in, the, in present days after the Second World War, after United Nations, often after the creation of the World Justice Jurist Association that we heard about in the video today in the morning. So I spoke too much, maybe, but <laughs> it's not about me. It's about these five persons. Please check what has happened with, with them. Some of them are in real danger, particularly Hamas. I'm very concerned with him and with uh, his family. He has two, two, two children. Uh, his liberty and it, the situation in the country is really dangerous. For the others, unfortunately, what is done is done. I hope Murat will get out of the jail uh, soon, uh, that Erika could return to, to, to her country, but the situation is really hard for, in many, for many of these five persons. Diego, you know everyone, everything about what I said. You heard it many times. Please, you I will maintain silence regarding the five countries so that uh, you, you research by, by your own. Uh, thank you, Jose. <coughs> thank you for the opportunity to be here with you all with this fantastic panel guided by the very close um, friend and companion in these uh, struggles for independence of judges in, 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 in the last uh, years. Um, in a context in which I will only repeat a phrase in which, with which I began my press conference in Warsaw, in Poland, after my visit to, official visit to Poland, uh, seven years ago, when the process of attack against independence of justice was just beginning in that country. And I said that the following, that was the, 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 what the press uh, published the day after, in Poland, justice is under attack. Hmm? Uh, I would say now in the world, justice is, is under attack, which means a matter that, as you all know better than me, uh, concerns not only uh, judges, uh, prosecutors, and their relatives, no? but of course uh, the society as a whole. Because without an independent uh, justice, how can you deal with uh, anything no? uh, that, that uh, begins with uh, civil complaints, uh, criminal procedures? and so on, and, and, and in a context in which, uh, as well, uh, the weakening of uh, state apparatus in several areas of the world, in Latin American, and African countries, or even in Asia, uh, de facto forces, no? uh, or in several cases of criminal organizations, uh, have much more uh, strength and control of societies than, one th than what uh, weak governments uh, may have. We have a fantastic set of uh, standards written and adopted by the UN for already more than 30 years. The basic principles on independence uh, of justice, principles oriented as well, uh, the guidelines for the role of uh, prosecutors, the Bangalore principles on uh, judicial conduct and, and, and integrity, and I always include uh, among the major standards for independence of justice, and I will explain later why, is the uh, International UN Convention Against Corruption. Because it requires, as a component for international cooperation, the role of extradition, the role of independent prosecutors and judges. If they weren't, it would be very difficult to implement these procedures of extradition, which are crucial in these standards. What is happening? I will make here a summary of a context that uh, you all, uh, I am sure you know perfectly, but you can choose two or three countries in any part of the world. Hmm? Uh, I mentioned by chance Poland because it was, was the, f the first uh, of official visit, visit I, I made to a country was Poland. Uh, the last ones were Bolivia and Uzbekistan. Uh, so you can find 
in several places the relevance of authoritarian approaches today guiding the world. Hmm? You can find that in Europe, you can find that in Asia, in Latin America, and of course, even in this country, I'm not speaking of the government, but, but obviously authoritarian tendencies that exist in, even, even in, in, in the United States. These authoritarian powers, the, which uh, very simplistically are doing is try to concentrate power, hmm? uh, looking for arguments or pretexts, like the one I heard in Poland, for instance, it was very important that the judges of the high court retire younger so that they can have a more happy life with their families. Hmm? The explanation was that they wanted to get rid of the president of the, of the Supreme Court, a very active woman. <laughs> but the law had an, a, an article that explained that if the judge wanted to stay more, he or she can ask to the president of Poland to remain in the, in the court. That was the, 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 the way in which independence was, uh, was to be protected. And you can find, of course, many cases of what is happening in my area, Latin America, what is happening in, in Guatemala, in which more than 30 judges and prosecutors uh, are exiled, most of them uh, here, here in the United States, what is happening in El Salvador, in which in the same week the Constitutional Court, the National Prosecutor were dismissed and replaced by political appointees, which are the ones that right now are authorizing the candidacy for the re-election of the president, uh, which is absolutely against what is written in, in, in the Constitution. You have other a couple of countries in Latin America, like, like Nicaragua or Venezuela, in which uh, independence of justice has been obviously obviously uh, suppressed, but many other countries in which we have uh, close, uh, closely worked with Jose in the, in the, in, in the association, uh, Poland, uh, Tunisia, uh, and many others, in which <coughs> uh, if you compare what has been happening in the last, in the last five or six years, is a kind, or we are more aware, we have more information, or the facts eventually are much more serious than what was happening before. We are in a context in which, speaking about elections, freedom, etc., has um, turned to be a more or less basic pet pattern for international commitments. But inside the authoritarianism, in processes in which eventually the governments are elected, that is the case on, in, in El Salvador, for instance, uh, they, they turn to be uh, closely authoritarian, and the first thing to be controlled is the judiciary and the public prosecutor's office. In our long history, for all the colleagues here from Latin America, we know what our history in the past was a military coup. So the important thing to control were the barracks. Right now, the barracks don't matter. Huh? They are doing their own businesses by, 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 by the side. What is more relevant is to control the judiciary so that this authoritarian approach can proceed. But this monster works with two legs. Huh? The other leg is corruption and organized corruption. Mm -hmm. and, uh, allow me to mention again a Latin American country, mm -hmm. you know, El Pacto de los Corruptos, the Agreement of the Corrupt, uh, mentioned in, in, in Colombia, in Guatemala, excuse me, uh, and a thing which is political arrangements so to maintain a system in which the main value is impunity, to <coughs> commit crimes, to bribery, uh, and so on. Uh, with this panorama, we would say we have the basic uh, instruments that I have already mentioned. Some of them, uh, the UN basic principles uh, adopted more than 35 years ago, which are absolutely fantastic. The same for prosecutors. And the Convention Against Corruption, which has not only uh, the fortune that it is very precise in the way in which justice can work, so to attack uh, corruption and especially organize international corruption, uh, but as well the instruments in which they in the in the in the in the meeting of the state parties they have included uh, as a component independence of the judiciary because they have noted that the basic principles of independence of the judiciary the basic principles on independence of the prosecutors are part of this system and this treaty is the treaty which one of the most big amount of countries even the United States which is 
not uh, always enthusiastic to be part of uh, international treaties. You know? So we, we are facing a, a, a situation in which, uh, regardless of what is happening in the in governments, uh, center, left, right, you know, uh, is a kind of genetical uh, tendency that uh, over omnipresence in the world to control everything. You know? So. Montesquieu is an old guy that uh, has been forgotten. Checks and balances uh, seems to be only an uncomfortable uh, thing to be an efficient uh, uh, state apparatus. And in the meanwhile, the rights of the society absolutely uh, excluded. Hmm? So w w w whatever uh, relevant aspect like, that, like the one we are going to, to, to hear in some minutes, you need an independent judiciary. Without an independent judiciary, there's no way to uh, to evolve to procedures to to to, to, to uh, I, I mentioned the obvious things about what is in, in, in why this is very important. But the, the thing that I was just trying to raise that we are living in an extraordinary situation by the awful, which is this kind of um, going backward in history. So at the end of the day, there are many aspects con connected. Of course, freedom of expression, freedom of election, and we could speak hours about the tendencies and threats. We were speaking outside before, before this meeting about what is, uh, it, what are the plans, political plans in certain countries. Uh, some of the nationals of those countries are sitting in, in, in this table. All of them, all of them, are oriented to have political control of the judiciary and not to improve with better resources, with better computers, with better administrative support. So. When anything happens in a political arena, we must always uh, see what, what has this fact uh, as connection with the independence of the judiciary or the lack of independence of the juries, which for my uh, very specific view is, has turned to be a very important thing. And to finish this, Jose, it's a context in which it's not a question only of uh, a sort of institutional or juridical evaluation of what was going on. There are facts, there are figures of judges being prosecuted in prison, uh, 2,500 judges, uh, lawyers, excuse me, have been killed during the last 10 years in the world. That's not because they have been assaulting banks, no? because they, are, they were lawyers performing their jobs. So all the guys that we are here, are technically under attack in the world because of the currents that begin to prevail, fortunately not everywhere, but in some places. So to share this view of these values, that's my personal experience in these years, is important not only for what uh, people like us that are enjoying the freedom we have, we have the possibility to be here in this kind of meeting, but really it's a, a question that uh, uh, increasing awareness is, uh, uh, excuse me for repeating the word, increasingly relevant. And again, thank you for, for all what uh, we have received uh, in, in, in my mission in the UN. I have been in this uh, house several places to discuss this, uh, these matters with many of you very friendly connections in, in, in our countries, and, and, and thank you for all. Thank you, Jeff. So let's move on for by far our most popular panelist. <laughs> Everyone wants to hear you, so you can speak for an hour. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, Jose Ramon, por favor. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I need to start with uh, an apology because I prepared my intervention. No? Here. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah? ¿Cuál se oye? Voy a dejar de ser popular con estos <laughs> micrófonos. <laughs> ¿Se oye mejor aquí o aquí? Ninguno. Están. Oh. Ok. Ya, yeah, ok. My chat. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> I'd like to start with um, an apologize because I prepared my intervention around the um, innocence claim, but Jose invited me to talk about the uh, Mexican situation and in general the judicial independence. And for that reason I uh, changed to Spanish. I so, so sorry. Bueno, <coughs> el, he, he estado escuchando estos días varias eh, intervenciones alrededor de Estado de Derecho. 
Y algo que me preocupa es que no hemos identificado, al menos en las charlas, cuál es la raíz del Estado de Derecho. Creo que lo que el Estado de Derecho hace es tratar de imponer una racionalidad jurídica a partir de lo dispuesto en normas jurídicas y en ciertas prácticas que realizamos con base en esas normas jurídicas. Si esto es así, el reto más importante del Estado de Derecho es entonces tratar de modificar conductas, de impedir conductas, la realización de ciertas conductas a partir de lo que esas normas jurídicas establecen. Y creo que a todos nosotros como expertos en la profesión nos queda claro que el modelo de generación de esas conductas y de esas normas sigue apelando al propio orden jurídico. Es decir, cuando actuamos como jueces, como abogados, etcétera, buscamos que sean las normas las que nos digan básicamente lo que se puede y lo que no se puede hacer. Voy a dejarlo así de sí. Consecuentemente, el modelo está hecho para que funcionemos alrededor de esas normas jurídicas. Y esta me parece que es la razón central de la independencia judicial. Necesitamos tener una independencia judicial para que las personas que actúan al interior del modelo jurídico puedan reproducir jurídicamente esas normas jurídicas. ¿Qué sucede cuando un juez deja de considerar lo que está dispuesto en una norma jurídica y piensa en los valores personales, religiosos, políticos, económicos que él tenga? ¿Qué piensa él respecto de los intereses de su comunidad o del grupo al que pertenece? Rompe esa racionalidad jurídica esa pretensión de que ajustemos nuestras conductas a esas normas jurídicas y, consecuentemente, se rompe esa pretensión de racionalidad del modelo jurídico de regulación de conductas. Creo que este es el verdadero problema del de Estado de Derecho 1 y 2 de la independencia judicial. Eh, cuando un juez, insisto, frente a un caso, no observa, con todos los márgenes que quieran ustedes de interpretación jurídica, lo que está en esos márgenes amplios, porque nunca son precisos, y supone que lo que debe hacer es incorporar su valor eh, por su preferencia religiosa, por su preferencia sexual, por su preferencia política, etc., me parece que empieza a distorsionar el modelo. Entonces, le estamos pidiendo a los jueces que mantengan su condición jurídica y su independencia jurídica, y por eso hacemos de la independencia judicial un valor para poder mantener ese procedimiento de actuación. Ahora, creo que la independencia judicial siempre ha estado presionada, ya ha estado presionada históricamente por distintos valores. Hoy no es tan evidente, al menos en ciertas comunidades, José acaba de contar algunos casos muy dramáticos, en donde ciertas presiones religiosas en ciertos momentos históricos incidían sobre los jueces para que los jueces resolvieran conforme a un cierto credo religioso. En algunos otros momentos, enormes presiones económicas influían sobre los jueces para que resolvieran los casos a partir de un ideario económico. Y así sucesivamente. Creo que en el momento actual la independencia judicial está sometida a grandes presiones por una multiplicidad de valores. Hoy se habló en la ceremonia de la mañana del populismo, que es este nombre con el que nos sentimos razonablemente cómodos todos para designar a un fenómeno político de nuestro tiempo. Y ese populismo de izquierdas o de derechas o con pretensiones de izquierdas o de derechas lo que hace es presionar a los jueces para romper la racionalidad jurídica en función de un proyecto político. Pero también tenemos una presión de la delincuencia organizada en muchos países, desafortunadamente muchos de nuestros países, en donde los propios delincuentes pretenden quebrar esa racionalidad jurídica, es decir, y repito, la operación de las normas jurídicas para tratar de imponer cierto tipo de solución. Y... Ok, thank you. Eh, me parece que esta es una <coughs> segunda cuestión. La tercera cuestión es que hay enormes intereses económicos que presionan también sobre los jueces para tratar de romper esa racionalidad jurídica, esas determinaciones iniciales de las normas, a fin de lograr 
eh, pues que los jueces se aparten de esos sentidos jurídicos básicos primarios y, e introduzcan algunos de estos elementos. Creo que estas son características no solo de México y no solo que estamos viviendo. Lo que México sí tiene de particular es un ejercicio político por parte del presidente López Obrador, quien dice y encabeza, de hecho, en alguna medida, el movimiento que él le denomina de la Cuarta Transformación, donde supone que existe una, un modelo político, una posibilidad de construcción respecto de la vida nacional que puede pasar por encima de las normas jurídicas, puede ir por un lado de las normas jurídicas para lograr esa realización política. El presidente López Obrador considera que su movimiento es una cuarta etapa desde el movimiento fundacional de México como nación independiente con la independencia de 1810, en donde se estableció una separación del Reino de España. Un segundo momento que es la eh, reforma, el momento en donde una separación en la iglesia y el Estado y también hubo una construcción de elementos liberales en nuestra sociedad, un tercer momento que es la revolución mexicana, una revolución de carácter social que reasignó la propiedad de la tierra, estableció nuevas condiciones de trabajo, en fin, tuvo una gran cantidad de consecuencias. El presidente López Obrador piensa que él está encabezando una cuarta etapa de la historia nacional, no queda muy claro cuáles son sus componentes materiales, ideológicos de ese movimiento, pero él supone que está encabezando. Y a partir de esta suposición de que está tratando de realizar, de desarrollar una actividad política diferente, es que me parece subordina la totalidad de las normas jurídicas, o si no la totalidad, si una parte muy importante de las normas jurídicas, para lograr la realización de ese proyecto político. De forma tal que si la Constitución <coughs> dice algunas cosas, el presidente ha tratado de modificarla en algunos casos, ha tratado de dar la vuelta en otros casos con la, con la Constitución, no lo obtuvo en su primer tercio, en el primer tercio de su sexenio, no lo está pudiendo hacer en el segundo tercio, la segunda parte de su, de su sexenio, y ahora lo que está haciendo es introducir estas modificaciones de leyes. Aquí lo peligroso respecto a la independencia judicial, José me decía que platicó con la, con la ministra Piña respecto a estos temas, no es una infidencia, simplemente es poner en, en, en perspectiva las preocupaciones que tenemos, lo que está sucediendo es que, Hemos encontrado, sobre todo a partir de este año, un poder judicial que está tratando de mantener una racionalidad jurídica con todos los problemas interpretativos que esto tiene, tampoco es algo nítido, es blanco y negro, es bastante más complicado, como todos ustedes lo saben, pero está tratando de mantener una racionalidad jurídica, resolviendo, conforme a alguna interpretación estándar de los textos y de los derechos humanos, las condiciones jurídicas en el país. Y lo que estamos enfrentando son amenazas muy serias a la independencia judicial, primero porque se quiere promover, cosa que sería desde mi punto de vista completamente inconvencional e inclusive inconstitucional, una reforma para elegir mediante voto popular a los ministros de la Suprema Corte de Justicia y a los jueces y magistrados federales, en un esquema semejante aquí al de los Estados Unidos en circuitos y distritos. En segundo lugar, me parece que es muy previsible que ahora en el mes de septiembre tengamos una discusión muy importante respecto a cuántos recursos se le van a otorgar al Poder Judicial de la Federación para su mantenimiento. Y un tercer ejercicio que ya no tiene que ver estrictamente con la construcción de las normas jurídicas son los señalamientos cada mañana. El presidente de México tiene una charla matutina de 7 a 9 y media, 10 de la mañana, todos los días, de lunes a viernes, en donde ha hecho señalamientos específicos, directos, respecto a los jueces, en algunas ocasiones con nombres y apellidos, como es el caso de la ministra Piña, y ahora entenderán los que no son mexicanos la importancia y el aplauso que en la mañana le dimos, los que estábamos allí en la, en la, en la, en la sala, que esto es muy importante en términos simbólicos para ella y para todos nosotros, pero también un señalamientos muy particulares respecto de otros jueces. A uno de ellos que otorgó suspensiones en materias de competencia económica, salió eh, con un antifaz como si fuera un delincuente en una mañana, 
ya vi la cara que hizo José, que abrió los ojos así bastante <risa> ampliamente, eso indica que, que la, lo que estoy diciendo hace mucho sentido, como si fuera un delincuente por haber otorgado algunas suspensiones en algunas materias. Y así como esos son este tipo de señalamientos que se dan. Me parece que entonces el problema que están enfrentando los jueces desde el punto de vista político es precisamente este, señalamientos desde la presidencia de la república respecto a la actuación de los ministros, los magistrados, los jueces. Y esto ha ido teniendo efectos en cascada. Tuvimos la manifestación del gobernador del estado de Veracruz que en un sábado se le ocurrió la buena idea de llevar a la Suprema Corte de Justicia ataúdes con los nombres de los ministros de la Suprema Corte que habían hablado de algunas, o que habían resuelto algunos casos importantes, como si estos ministros estuvieran muertos o como si desearan la muerte de estos ministros, cualquiera que sea la interpretación es gravísima para una independencia judicial. Y algo que también me parece sumamente delicado es que este ambiente que se ha ido generando desde la presidencia de la república como un caso de linchamiento hacia los jueces empieza a tener también repercusiones no solo en estos actores políticos importantes sino en algunos otros actores políticos y sociales en un contexto como saben ustedes en donde nuestro país está en una situación de enorme presión por parte de las delincuencias de todo tipo, de todo género y de todas actividades que están regadas en el territorio nacional. Creo entonces que la condición de la independencia judicial sí es importante que la comentemos en estos eventos, sí es importante que la comunidad jurídica internacional se entere de estas condiciones que se están dando, hay eh, colegios de abogados representados aquí muy dignamente el día de hoy, tres colegios importantes, la Barra Mexicana Colegio de Abogados, la Asociación Nacional de Abogados de Empresa, el Ilustre Nacional Colegio de Abogados, algunas otras asociaciones que están aquí, de jueces de magistrados que están haciendo un enorme esfuerzo por sostener estas condiciones de la independencia judicial a partir de la idea, y con esto termino, de la necesidad de mantener una racionalidad jurídica porque las normas en el orden jurídico mexicano con todos sus problemas han sido determinadas en los años recientes mediante procesos democráticos y nadie podría de sostener lo contrario. Creo que estos son los retos de la independencia judicial. Eh, lamento no haber hablado en inglés, pero hice este cambio a partir de la invitación de José. Muchas gracias. Gracias, José Ramón. Uh, we need to adapt, to adjust to the, the circumstances of each day, of each hour. That was the, the sense of my, my request. Uh, Mexico is, is, is now facing a very difficult situation. I had uh, some discussions yesterday with uh, Justice Norma uh, Pina, and I was uh, impressed what, what she told me about it, and the situation is really, really very, very complicated and dangerous for the rule of law. So that is why I thought that it would be the right moment, having in mind also the auditorium, to speak about this issue and to bring it to the light, because this is our role here also in this, in this Congress. There is so many important persons. I, I would like to salute my dear friend, Minister Antonio Herman Benjamin from Brazil. He's, 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 he deserves a round of applause. For those who know him, he is uh, the master in, in one of the most important uh, situations that we have now in the world, that is the environment. He's the president of the Global Judicial Institute on Environment, uh, an, an organization by judges, composed by judges, uh, that, is, uh, that has a leading role in United States and United Nations and all over the world on this very important topic. I was in the morning In the, in the panel, and really environment and rule of law, there are maybe the most important topics for us jurists at the present day. That is why I, I would like to mention his presence that I, I, thank, I, I am thankful for. So now you are moving on to Gonzalo Ospina. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Jose, for giving me the opportunity to speak to this audience. 
To do those who don't know me, my name is Juan Ospina and I come from Madrid, from Spain, and I am a criminal lawyer. And I always love to be seated next to the judges. I thought lawyers like to speak, but after hearing all of you, I think I was wrong. <laughs> I think you could think how, how much uh, judges like to use uh, the, the opportunity to speak in such a nice audience. I want to thank all of you that have come from Brazil, from Ecuador, from Argentina, Juan Pablo, Karina. A lot of people are coming from also from Spain, and you make this Congress important. All of you with your energy and with the different experiences, experience that you can bring makes this Congress important, and the most important issue is to bring back to our countries what we have heard and what we have learned. To, be, to me, it's a particular honor to be seated in this uh, panel with such well-known judges to speak precisely about independence of the judicial system. Being next to, to Diego is a great opportunity when he, he those who don't know him, I, I recommend you to Google him. He was president of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Uh, it's a real honor as a criminal lawyer to be next to judges that, be, that believe in the respect of a, a fair trial, in the respect of a trial with all guarantees and the rule of law. I want to speak about independence in the judicial system because as a lawyer, I believe that this is the most, the most important fundamental right. As lawyers, if we don't have a judicial system which is independent, we cannot work and we cannot show our abilities to protect the rights of our clients. So if we don't have a real independent system, we cannot be and we cannot uh, defend our clients from the point of view of the right of defense. I also want to make uh, a point of view that in the judicial independence is important to protect our fundamental rights, but in which way? I want to share with the audience three points of view. The first one, to protect the principle of equality. If there is not independence in the judicial system, citizens are not equal in the law. Why? Because judges can break in favor of those that provides the power. The power of the political system, the power of economic system, the power of the media or the social media. And that's why we need. Hopefully, uh, Jose, in the future, this audience is not fulfilled only by jurists, but also by politicians, that maybe they can hear us and think that we really need to protect our judicial system in order to protect our societies. And it's also important for them to understand that if we want to have economic growth, we need to have independence in our judicial system. Why? As I was explaining before, because we must be equal in front of the law. It's a Pleasure to speak here in New York, probably the capital of the world of freedom, of freedom of economic, the capital of the world in, politi in politics. We have the United Nations across the street, and probably all the big important economic issues happen here. And I think it's very important also to have this Congress here in this city to bring the world to understand that we must protect our judges. The second issue I wanted to talk is about freedom. Freedom as a criminal lawyer, because if we don't have real independent judicial system, our freedom can be um, not as protected as it should be in those important cases where we fight against the power. Diego was explaining that judges and lawyers have been murdered in order to do our work. That's why it's very important to understand that if we want to have a strong democratic system, we must, we must have an independent judicial system. But not only to protect and prevent the power, but in order to progress as societies. I believe that if, poli if politicians really believe in having and protect their citizens, they should think that the first fundamental right they should protect 
is the independent of the judicial system in order to help the economic growth of the country be independent and have freedom of economic. For me, it's also a great opportunity to be next to Joanna. I was explaining her before coming to this panel that she's an example of why we need independent in our judicial system. Why we need independent in our judicial system? Because in those cases that happen, it happens, we fight against the power, we fight against politicians. Judges like Joanna can show that citizens are equal in front of the law. As, as a lawyer, it's an honor to be next to Joanna because if we didn't have law judges like her, all the system and all the principles and all the values that we believe, they shouldn't, they wouldn't directly happen. So, to keep on forward my uh, speech, I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank my colleagues here in the table. Jose, it's also an honor to be next to you. For those who don't know you, you were elected president of the appeal court in Oporto by your colleagues, judges. That means that you are a very fair judge that believe that the, the, the right to come to this type of uh, Congress are important in order to find unity between lawyers, judges, and the whole society. Thanks for all of you that have come all over the world, all abroad. I'm more happy to share with you. And I would like to end my speech making a very brief uh, resume in how power is always trying to attack our judges. In Latin America, we have the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. In Europe, we have the European Human Rights Court. And these courts exist because our politician system, our powers, like to go against the citizens. Here in New York, one of the main cities where the founding fathers uh, fight for independence and fight for the Bill of Rights, I want to share with you that lawyers in our country, judges in our cities, we must be clear and we must be brave to request from our political systems that we must and we wish to have independent system and maybe in 20 years time, in 50 years time, these international courts will don't have to occur because our countries protect as is necessary is our fundamental rights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. Thank you very much for your words. Uh, no judicial, if there is no judicial independence, lawyers cannot work. This is very interesting. Um, so, uh, a wrongful convicted person. We know that. Is there something that can be done? I think this is a, a question that uh, recently is putting more and more in the, in the, in the public uh, scrutiny, in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the public opinion. And the conclusion is that, at least in international law, there is an innocence gap. Uh, and this is something that I read about it, I, I tried to study, and I was really impressed because this is a topic that maybe us, as jurists, could uh, lead, could have a more closer look. Because if you, if you see an innocent man convicted and you can do nothing about it, there is no international law that respects this basic principle that if someone is innocent, he cannot continue to be convicted. We have presumption of innocence as international human right, but we, we don't have a right to claim innocence. This is rather disturbing, at least in, in my perspective. Uh, but Justice Joanna Seibert, can you explain much better? Thank, Thank you, you very much. Jose, I am honored to be here with such luminaries as you have, including our young advocate here for judicial independence. Um, I had been a member 
of the International Association of Judges and served as vice president of our ANO group, as Jose has mentioned. But I'm a really local hometown gal, born and bred in New York, and I basically was very fortunate in that I got to see both sides of the equation, the side where I represented individuals who were indigent and needed legal representation here in New York City, uh, in Manhattan, and in Brooklyn. And I did that for a number of years. And then I was even more fortunate to work for the federal defenders, defending people charged with federal crimes. And I got to do that. And then I went out to Long Island, more of a suburban community, and was able to interact representing, of all people, the police and the county who were charged with violating the constitutional rights of individuals, whether it was excessive force, whether it was an unfair trial where they weren't afforded the rights. And that gave me a balance, I'd like to think. But it's been a long time. I've been a federal judge. I was a state court judge. And state court judges, quite frankly, there are politics involved. And to put it bluntly, there are politics involved in all kinds of judicial selections, whether it be from a university, or it be prior judges, or it be out and out politicians. So some countries probably should never have an election of judges, but some countries manage to at least do it for the first election of the judge and perhaps pass on it later. But it's almost impossible to suggest that a bulk ballot of judges in a country from the Supreme Court to the lowest court is going to be knowledgeable, fair, equitable, and, tight, and get the type of judiciary you would like. So the advantage of being old is that you get to see the whole history of everything. And when I started out, I graduated law school in 1971, and there were very few women involved. And it was a unique experience to go into these courtrooms and have prosecutors, generally men, some women, and represent someone who was charged with serious crimes. However, you got used to it after a while, and I think I probably did the best I could have done for the persons I had. Not everybody I had, I hope, was innocent. Many of them did go to trial in those days. But now you have mass plea bargaining, and that creates a host of problems. So for example, some people will be incarcerated pending trial, and it's very difficult for persons that don't have the funding to get experts to run DNA tests which didn't exist in my time. But now we see slowly since 1992 the creation of these innocence projects. We see, I hope, more of a balance. You know, the fact that there were people that were put to death and were innocent is a horrible stain on any country. And I know we can do better, and people are sincere in making these efforts. So what are the main culprits? Well not having the appropriate scientific evidence come into a trial. Certainly, years ago, bite marks were considered scientific proof of certain things. Certain types of, uh, types of uh, analysis when it came to guns were considered very important. Fingerprint evidence. If I had a client that had fingerprint evidence against them, that was the end of that case. But even fingerprint evidence can be somewhat sloppy if you have police who think the person is guilty. They're guilty, oh, just, just say it's there or put it there. In the one case I had, and this goes back to a 1985 rape and murder of a 16-year-old girl. In that particular case, I didn't represent the three defendants, but the police obtained a taped, filmed confession of one individual who then incriminated two other individuals. And that was shown to the jury because it was considered voluntary. It was probably the result of overreaching on the police part. 
Those three individuals went to trial separately, and they were convicted. And they served 18 years each until the Innocence Project came in and found DNA years later, many years later, that was on the victim. Think of the waste, the horror of these individuals going to jail for 18 years. Think of the family who lost their daughter and the real culprit, the murderer and rapist, was never found. We cannot afford to make these mistakes. And I have never said and never will that the police are the enemy. There are many good police officers. And in case involving excessive force, what often happens is you see the police immediately being charged in some instances and not in other instances. It has to be balanced. So in terms of right to innocence, the Innocence Project, we recently had come onto our court a judge Nina Morrison, and Judge Morrison represented two of the people that were in this particular case I've described to you. And those individuals, two of them, were able to obtain, after a jury verdict, were able to obtain $18 million apiece. And if I ask any of you, would you rather have $18 million or spend $18 million years, as far as I'm concerned, 18 years incarcerated, I think the answer is clear. You'd much rather forget the money and just not go to jail. So what are some of the suggestions? Better DNA, forensic evidence, better experts, maybe a separate lab in some instances. All of this takes money, and it's important that we, we have that type of approach, that it's worth it. So. Judges take additional programs. And essentially, do we need commissions? Do we need standalone rights? Or do we need something with respect to a combination? We need to engage with the police and the criminal justice system to see what better methods can be put together in order to have fairer trials, in order to ensure that there is a claim to innocence rules with respect to finality, whether or not we need to have a limit on when you can come in with new evidence, there really shouldn't be a limit. I understand the other side of this in that the families will truly be horrified if the person they believe committed the crime is let out. How much evidence do you need for exoneration? I leave that for future lawmakers. I leave that to persons on a jury. And I leave it to you to come up with the brilliance of making this a human right that can be honored at the UN and can be impressed upon the various judiciaries, the various countries that I have. And I thank you very much for having me here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, really wonderful to, to see for, for one side the, the personal experience as lawyers, as judges, working on these different environments, and then to have this approach on the issue itself of having a human right consecrated by UN uh, about claiming innocence. It was really interesting, uh, Joanna. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, uh, finally, last but not least. <laughs> Our, our good friend, uh, Justice uh, Leo Maury Gordon, also uh, a member, active member of EAJ, also uh, very committed in the, in the international uh, uh, level. Uh, you have the floor. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Jose. Um, I came here today um, with a thought that I was going to spend a fair amount of my time talking about the innocence gap. And, and as a result of the wonderful presentations um, that preceded me, uh, I think I'm going to shift a little bit and, and spend some time talking about um, judicial independence and then circling back and tying it to the, to the innocence gap. Um, I'm a very fortunate and unique jurist. Uh, I have spent close over 40 years of my life in the third branch of government. Um, I come to that with a very 
interesting and unique perspective. The first part of my professional career as a young lawyer was spent working in the legislative branch where I was tasked with the responsibility of writing the legislation that created the court on which I now serve. And so I had to take in information from all perspectives, the private bar, the government bar, and the court was a successor court to a then existing judicial institution. Um, I spent five years of my life um, on Capitol Hill, and, and so I have a, a very unique perspective on what it takes to write legislation that affects courts that stands the test of time. And, and I say this uh, not by way of um, ego in any way, shape, or form, but uh, as a statement of fact. The statutes that were created that created, that brought the Court of International Trade into being <laughs> are in large measure exactly the same today as they were in 1980 when the court came into being. That is a testament to the fact that time has proven that those statutes have created an entity that is committed to dispensing justice in the world of customs and international trade law. From the time I left Capitol Hill, I have spent the rest of my career in the judiciary. The first 20 some odd years of my life in the judiciary was as the chief lawyer for the court and then the chief operating officer, the clerk of the court. And as a result, I have had to interact with the judges of the court and the judges of our Court of Appeals, and I've had to interact with the public and the bar, both government and private, and have spent a lot of time uh, hosting and educating uh, foreign delegations of judges who have come to the United States and wanted to learn uh, about the Court of International Trade. Uh, in that capacity, um, I developed uh, a fair amount of credibility and expertise in the rule of law, and since I became a judge 17, 18 years ago, I've committed myself to doing international rule of law projects in a variety of places throughout the world. Uh, I've spent the vast majority of that time um, in Latin, Amer Latin and South America working with an entity called the Academy for the Interchange and exchange of judicial matters based in Buenos Aires. Uh, I am now a delegate to the IAJ from the United States Federal uh, Judiciary where I spend a bunch of my time committed to rule of law projects and um, the role of technology, so I'm very much involved in study commission number two. But I'm a brand new member to IAJ. This is, come Taiwan will be my second uh, experience. Um, but I've had the opportunity to work with many delegations of judges, both when they come to the United States and when I go to visit. And, and I've been exposed to many things on the civil side and some on the, on the, on the criminal side. And, and I've developed um, what I hope is a fairly enlightened view about the needs of judiciaries throughout the, throughout the world. And, and I start from um, the, following, uh, the following place. There are three independent and theoretically co-equal branches of government that exist in, in many, if not most, of the nations of the world. The challenge for us in the third branch, in the judiciary, is what are the threats or impediments to the ability of the judiciary to truly function as an independent co-equal branch. There are challenges that come from without and there are challenges that come from within. Fortunately or unfortunately as the case may be, allocation of resources and money is at the top of the list. There are well-intentioned members of the judiciary 
in many, many countries who are committed to transparency, who are committed to progress, who are committed to making sure that the judiciary is open and available to all, that there is access. The difficulty is there's not necessarily the resources or the commitment or the experience or the intellectual capability, not from a lack of intellect, but from a lack of sharing knowledge, right, to allow the judiciary to meet these goals. I do not believe that one can talk about the independence of the judiciary without talking about the rule of law, and I do not believe that one can talk about the rule of law without talking about the independence of the judiciary. They are equal, and they must work hand in hand for the system to be effective. Many of the things that, that, that my, my co-panelists here have mentioned, um, corruption, conflicts, um, ethical problems, commitment to principles and standards, they are there, right? We do not live in a, in a perfect world, right? The, the experience that we deal with is a human endeavor, and humans are not perfect. That's why there are those little rubber things on top of wooden sticks called erasers on, on pencils. The question really is, how do we move forward? How do we create progress to enable the judiciary and the rule of law to meet the internationally understood and perhaps even agreed upon standards and principles that make up the rule of law, that we all inherently attempt to understand and think that we all agree upon, uh, I would argue that there are significant cultural differences that drive the lenses that people look through in understanding those principles and standards. Um, I, I think that there are inadvertently and maybe in certain circumstances actually purposefully um, imbalances in the system that um, lead to questions in the mind of the public and potentially undermine the confidence that the public has in the judiciary. So let me give you an example. Uh, I traveled to one country uh, that is in the Central Caucasus, and I learned by observation that despite all of the best intentions to reform the judicial process, there are visual cues that make that very difficult to accomplish. When you walk into a criminal courtroom and the judge is on the bench in a suit and the prosecutor is there in a robe or a uniform, that connotes that the power in the courtroom is not with the judge that the judge and the judicial system is not necessarily, though the words are said, is not a co-equal branch. That the power, right, let rests with the prosecutor. That creates issues on the innocence gap, right? I've traveled to another part of the world, Southeast Asia, where there is no such thing as a court reporter, that they do not use technology to record the proceedings, that the judge is responsible, assuming they have an assistant, for, in essence, handwriting down the proceedings, taking notes on the proceedings, which then gets transmitted to some form of transcript, which is then provided to the parties Right, and then they debate back and forth whether or not the judge's handwritten notes, right, are an accurate reflection of the proceedings. That reduces the judge to being a scrivener, right? 
subject to the importuning of the plaintiff or the defendant's lawyer or the plaintiff's lawyer or the government prosecutor as to what actually took place as opposed to a judge reviewing a transcript and evaluating the testimony and evidence that is presented. If you have to concentrate on scrivening, you are not paying attention, right, to the demeanor of the witnesses, to the efficacy of the testimony, to the quality of the evidence that is being presented. These are all subtle and yet overt challenges to the rule of law and the independence of the judiciary. So what are some of the ways that we can engage uh, in a process to make life better? I think among the top priorities has to be education. And education comes in a variety of shapes and sizes. It is civics education to the populace so that they understand truly what the role of the judiciary is and why the judiciary is called upon to exercise its neutrality and its independence in evaluating the claims that are before it. But it is also education for the judiciary, not only the judges, but the people who serve as law clerks to the judges and the people who work in the clerk's offices, right, who receive the information and are processing it through to understand what their role is and where improvements can be made. Just because we have a title, because we become a judge, does not infuse us with all knowledge on every topic that comes before us. If we are going to seek improvements in the law, if we are going to seek improvements in the rule of law and in the administration of justice, it comes from sharing the challenges that we experience with our colleagues both internally and with colleagues internationally because in my view, the only way that we can make progress and reach the standards and principles on the rule of law that we all perceive that we understand collectively, it comes from sharing our experiences and how we approach solving the challenges and the problems that are presented to us in order to have the law progress in a manner for it to be responsive to the needs of our localities, of our communities, our countries as a whole, and issues that go cross-border, such as the innocence, the innocence gap. Um, we need to recognize that there are differences in approach between civil code countries and common law experiences, and to try to find ways in which those actually cross over each other and where we can find common ground to help improve our perspective as jurists in, 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 in solving these challenges. It comes in understanding where the threats are to judges, whether it comes from a lack of technology or a lack of education, transparency, social media, and actual physical threats that, 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 are, that are out there. Um, and how do we solve these things? How do we come to a common language and a common understanding that helps us fully appreciate and understand that words matter and the choice of words matter? How we describe what we're doing so that those who are utilizing the system understand what we're considering, why we're considering it, how we're, we're considering it, and how it factors into ultimately our decision is critical. Our voice comes in our decisions. And so therefore words matter, the choice of words matter, the inflection of our words and our voices when we read judgments from the bench all matter. And understanding that we have an obligation when we write a judgment, when we write an opinion, to be as clear, as candid, as simple 
straightforward so that the average person with an average education can understand what we're saying, why we're saying it, and how we came to our conclusion. It is, that is a challenge, it is difficult, it is hard to write less than it is to write more. It is hard to write in simple, understandable language than it is to write in the complexities and the lingo of the, of, of the law. But we owe our best efforts to make sure that anyone who reads our judgments and decisions understands why we did, what we did, and how we got to that end point. So simply uh, for me, I cannot talk about independence of the judiciary without talking about the rule of law, and I cannot talk about the rule of law without talking about the independence of the judiciary. We have great challenges that lay before us, but I believe that we can meet those challenges. Let us try not to be so convoluted in our approaches. Let us try to find the common ground. Let us try to find the way to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. We will not achieve perfection, but we will make progress in the name of judicial independence and the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you. Inspiring words, uh, in fact. Um, we still have two minutes. <laughs> so if someone wants to speak. Thank you very much. It's so inspiring. I, I believe, I know this country in the Central Caucasus and the, in the Central Asia, and I know the system, that's why. I have only one practical question. I accept everything about the education, the necessity of the responsibility. Do you think that there are some instrumental, maybe mechanisms to uh, elect or uh, appoint judges to help avoid this irresponsible system of non-independent judges. I believe that in my country, all judges devote to be dismissed. Change is hard, right? Winning the hearts and minds of the public and getting them to understand is hard. I do not believe that there is a single magic bullet that solves the problem. But I do believe that education, talking about these things in public, right, finding ways for judges to communicate and lawyers collectively to support um, is a, a way. Some of this, very candidly, simply depends upon the culture and experience of the country or community that you're talking about. What, what is required to help folks in Eastern Europe or Western Europe understand these principles is arguably different than what is necessary to get folks to understand these principles in the Middle East. Yesterday, I spent an hour and a half talking to judges from a Middle Eastern country about concepts of administrative law and judicial review. It was hard for them. The very first question I got was, what happens if the governmental agency refuses to send to the court the record of what happened before the agency? That is an anathema to what happens here in the United States. Why that would happen in a, in a country in another part of the world who operates in a different legal system is hard for me to fathom other than to accept for the fact that it does. It is a matter of respect of one branch of the government by another. I can't teach respect. I can earn respect. And that comes through conversation and comes through actions. Right? But it only happens incrementally. There is no magic wand to make it happen instantaneously. Right? And if people were educated or raised in an environment 
that doesn't promote that sense of equality, right? That overtly or subtly promotes a sense of imbalance as to where the power lies, it takes time. Uh, it's an unfortunate thing. Would I love to see it in our collective lifetimes? Absolutely. Can it happen? Possibly. But it requires each and every one of us to commit in, a, in our own way to do it. And that's hard. We have to seek it. We have to find advocates who will promote it. Judges, you have to understand, judges have no natural constituency. We don't represent people. We represent a system and a concept. It is hard for judges to advocate, right? It depends upon a system of ethics, of code of conduct, of conflicts, how you deal with corruption, overt or otherwise, but we have no natural constituency, right? We don't collect a fee for representing somebody in court, like my colleague at the end of, at the, end of the table. <laughs> Our natural constituency are the lawyers who need the system to work so that they can effectively represent their clients. We don't have that constituency. They do. Okay, sorry to interrupt. As, as, as Roland said, you are very vocal. You speak very well. You don't seem like a judge. <laughs> passion, I have. You have passion, that's for sure. Uh, you want to say something? Yes, yes absolutely. You already name it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, thank you.